Now, um, we're going to talk about civilizations aren't invented. Okay, civilizations are actually created, they're built up. In our natural world, there's been a whole host of people making uh, contributions, which a lot of single contributions make up a civilization, and particularly if it's going to be functioning. I can't mention everyone, it's obvious, but some of the obvious things are that whoever perfected the concept of a wheel and an axle and put it onto a vehicle of some type made a huge contribution uh, to the human race. Those who managed to make fire easy to reproduce through a series of different systems to create a spark or a flame, they contributed a lot to the world. Uh, then some of, I guess some of the obvious ones we know is that uh, Louis Pasteur with milk, to sterilise milk and the sterilising process. There's a variety of people who have contributed something. And once something good comes into a civilisation, it stays there and we build upon it. Now, I'm going to talk about the Lord's civilisation today because it's going to be in a way that you might not uh, perhaps identify in, in sort of a step-by-step -step method, even though it's all there. But I'm going to just bring out a couple of uh, major contributors which have made the Lord's people and the walk in the Lord and the church, the spiritual civilization that we have, has made it possible. And I'd like to cover some really good points here. Our theme topic today is how people have been able to turn failure, particularly in the Lord, into great comfort. So it's about turning failure into great comfort. And it's not about negative things, it's just that we need things to go wrong so that we can actually find a solution so we can get it right. And God has been good at that. He's been good at getting things right and building a very strong civilization. When we go through the great blessings of God's people, we realize that some people perhaps have contributed a lot more to the future of the church than we ever would have imagined. And I believe that some of these people contributed more than what they even imagined themselves. In fact, I'd even go as far as to say that some of these people have contributed a lot more to the effective blessing the church has from God than what we might even realise at this point. And uh, we look forward to having the wisdom of God reveal the, the full blessing which is available. There is a scripture that tells us to count it all joy when we fall into tribulation or temptation. And why would you say count it all joy when something hurts you? Because in God's civilization, walking in the Spirit, it's an opportunity for the blessing of the Holy Spirit to deliver us from things which are normally not able to be overcome. And the Lord puts it together nicely. So I'm going to try and tailor these thoughts down, with perhaps using some of the scriptures very wholesomely and very correctly, but perhaps not quite that you've heard before along the lines of a spiritual civilization or a church. It's the same concept. But I'd like to turn to 2 Corinthians 1 verse 4 because I believe this verse is highly underrated and makes a lot more promise than we could ever understand. Perhaps this will be one of the verses we don't understand till the Lord returns. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 4. You'll know it. It's a very good verse in the sense of being supportive. He says, Who comforted us, referring to Jesus Christ, through the power of God, who comfort all of us in our tribulation. And it goes on to explain why we get comfort. A lot of us just, oh, that's all we hear. Comforting us in our tribulation, because most times when we look at the things of the Lord like this, it's because we've sort of got difficulty. We feel we're feeling pain or we're feeling distress or we're feeling, um, as we covered a, a week or two ago, our backs are against the wall and we're not quite sure uh, what we should do. So we read here, who comforts us in all our tribulation, for what purpose? That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. This is a, a powerful entry into some of these promises that God's made. This promise of comfort is greater than you think. And I'm not saying you're silly. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying this topic is bigger than the surface of it. The Holy Spirit has a name equally. It's called the Comforter. The Lord said when the Comforter is come, he will do certain things. One, he would bring things to our remembrance. And of course, a lot of people think, oh, that means I won't forget anything. No, it doesn't mean that at all. 
What it means is the promises that God's made to us will be brought into mind like a memory so that we can understand. It's almost like a revelation, but it will come via the concept of a memory. He will bring all things to our remembrance, meaning that everything that's been said as a benefit and a blessing, as we approach the wisdom of it, God will then bring it into our heart and mind, and it will seem like a comfort in the sense of a memory of something that we maybe have already known and we can't quite recall how we learnt it. But this is a, a method that the Holy Spirit uses. It brings things into mind, and one of the best ways we can perhaps understand it, it's almost like you're memorising something, but you're not. It's actually being given to you as a blessing, but it comes in this concept of almost being like a memory. You're sort of pulling it out of your stock of known uh, uh, knowledge. So, this comfort... He will comfort us in all our, not some of our tribulation, make this point here, all, all our tribulation. See, God's unlimited. God is unlimited. A lot of people say, oh, God can do this and he can forgive this, but he can't forgive that and he can't. We'll just cut all that out. Humans are the ones who put a degree of sin against sin itself. God doesn't do it that way. In James, God simply says, if you breach one part of the law which might be eating food with one washed, unwashed hands, which is a, you might call it a minuscule event, that if you breach one part of the law, you are guilty of breaking it all, meaning that every other sin is equally committed at that time. Maybe not in consequence, because there are consequences to sins, but in, as sense as being, in the sense of being a default in God's eyes, any default is equal to all defaults. It's simply a rule of the spirit. But we, we get confused because we think that sin A is worse than sin B and sin B is worse than sin C and we go down this trail of trying to work it all out. What did the Lord say? He said, I will give them comfort in all the tribulation. All, not some. God has a solution to all. Now, just to diverge just for a moment, is there a sin that God can't forgive? Yes, there is. What is that sin? Of course, now you're expecting me to say something like homosexuality, adultery, murder, or whatever, and I would say, no, it's none of those sins. The sin God cannot forgive you for are, are the sins that you refuse to repent from. They're the ones he can't forgive us from, the ones we don't repent of. That's the end of the argument, because the scriptures go on to prove that almost every sin, including blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which Paul admitted in his writing, that he blasphemed God. He blasphemed the Spirit. He denied Christ. He was consenting to the death of the saints. He was consenting to the confiscation of their assets. And when he came to the church, many of the church members refused to meet up with him because they said, don't you know what this man has done? He has killed church people. He has taken their assets. He's ruined families. He's destroyed lives. God forgave him. Sometimes it's us who don't do the forgiving rather than God. But that's another topic. I'm not going to go there. So we have this promise, this promise of comfort, which ultimately the Holy Spirit being the comforter is the prime example and demonstration of God's comfort and the ability to be comforted by God in every situation known to man. Outside of after you're dead, there's no comfort there. There can be nothing can reverse what has happened to that point. If you've been walking in the Lord, praise God. If you haven't been walking in the Lord, there's no way of turning the clock back. And we're sort of, as my mother used to say, she'd tell me often, if I used to pull a face behind her back, she would say, if the wind changes while you pull that face, you'll be stuck with it forever. And I used to have to go and look in the mirror to make sure I wasn't stuck with that face. Sadly, I was. <laughs> anyway, so... This is a misunderstanding of spiritual principles. I'd like to go through three major contributions of comfort to the church. You've heard them all over the last two months, but now in this context, you'll see why the significance of setting the groundwork up first, then going through the promises, now putting it all together as a benefit to the church. It becomes easy to digest and easy to understand. Genesis 17 verse 7 is the first reference and we're just going to make it uh, just a quick reference. We've heard a lot about Abraham and this is Abraham 
But we're going to cover something perhaps that we didn't cover before because we've seen a whole series of things, how God promised him and blessed him and he'd be a company of nations and all this, and uh, priests and kings would come out from him and da-da-da-da-da. Uh, all that is there, but I'd like to make a point to, to something of comfort even greater than that because we're talking, talking about spiritual civilization as opposed to natural civilization. Genesis 17.7 he said, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed and thee in their generation for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Now this is the promise and it's a magnificent promise which no other humans ever had before. And they went from being unable to bear children to bearing children at a time when they couldn't in their old age when both of them were past the point of uh, physically being capable of parenting in the sense of creating a child and God turned that around for them. And when uh, Sarah passed on, she had one child and that was representative of a company of millions that the Lord would bring out of them. That's all she saw. But that was the start of a spiritual civilization which God would bless. But there's something else in this story which we'll quote in a little while, but I'll just verbally do it now. Abraham actually earned a title, which was of great comfort, which we're going to see in a moment. He was called the friend of God. Abraham and his wife, because they trusted in what God said, they went against the grain of opposition. They went against the grain of everything their natural and uh, other friendly minds might have produced to them. And as a result of being faithful, God called him a friend. And that's a very powerful position to be in because friendship has qualities about it that legalism doesn't have. Friendship, you know, we forgive our friends. We forgive our friends. There's uh, some very powerful things. We don't see, even though our friends can be a bit silly at times, we see the good in them. We enjoy their company. We like to be around them. We're on the same page with sense and purpose. And that's why most people enjoy friendships because people get on the same page as them. Well, God said through Abraham's sacrifice, I'm paraphrasing obviously, he said, you're on the same page as me. You're my friend and we're going to stay that way. But he introduced friendship. Up until this point, no one had ever been called the friend of God. And like civilization, up until the first wheel, an axle com combined was put together as a vehicle in one form or another, as a cart or as some other dragging body. No one had put those things together, but once it was put together, it became a permanent inheritance of the civilization. Now, this friendship, which uh, uh, Abraham started with God, it became a permanent inheritance for all those who had come after. And it's very powerful, but it's actually referred to in similar words later on. I'll go to number two, Numbers 25, verse 10. This is Phineas. Phineas, it's a name we don't hear very often. In fact, it's probably a name that many would not have heard. Phineas was a, a priest. And in the travel of Moses, with a lot of the things Moses established on the earth, in their travels through the promised land, he, as we know, we heard that a while back, Moses had up to here with trouble. It was just trouble everywhere, but there was blessing everywhere equally. Every time trouble came, God saved them. Water came out of the rock. This happened, that happened. He brought the manna in. He brought the food in. He saved them from their enemies. It just went on perpetually. There's wonderful things happening. But Phineas did something, which for a spiritual civilization, he set it for us to have something which was not set before this time. I'd like to read it to you. Numbers 25, 10. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, have turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore, say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. Covenant of peace. This is amazing. This is part of a civilization. This is a covenant that God would be peaceful towards his priests, that he would be on the same page and work with them. And he shall have it and his seed after him 
even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement, meaning he paid the price for the children of Israel. So we have a guaranteed lifelong right to approach God for restoration because we have peace with God. We sing it, we have peace with God. It's one of the choruses. Peace with God. This is a spiritual inheritance which was brought forward by someone being faithful to God which became part of the blessings which God would bestow upon his people including us even to this day. A covenant of peace, a priesthood. This was not given to anyone else. He, he did that and the reason he was uh, able to be given it is that behind the scenes which we don't see directly in the story in Numbers but as you know that there's Genesis and Numbers and sometimes Chronicles which repeat some of the stories and you've got to sort of get them all together but there, they, the king of Moab was nearby and they had a totally Gentile system and he wanted to corrupt the Israelites into following their gods and goddesses so what they did one of the high priests or one of the priests of higher authority in Moses' group of people. I'm not sure which tribe it came out. The story is there, the names are there. I just didn't bother to research them because I don't need to because what I'm quoting is actually here. So that's okay. But uh, the priest, his son, went out and they thought they took it upon themselves to change the direction that God was taking Moses. They didn't like the Holy Spirit. They wanted a different type of fellowship. They didn't want the fellowship that God was providing and we see this is quite frequently uh, an attitude today in the, the world of uh, spiritual blessing. A lot of people don't want the fellowship that God's able to provide through the Holy Spirit. They want something else. So the high priest's son chuffs off over to the temple and gets one of the high priests from the Moabite priesthood system, gets his daughter, who's high up in the priestess, symbol and they get together and they think they're going to start this new religious order in the temple at that stage the temple was cloth and tent as you're probably aware so they go in and do what they do trying to establish this new system and getting the people of israel to follow and by the way the people of israel didn't take much to start running after stupid ideas as we see the history there they you only needed to throw them a free donut no with you type of thing anyway so there they were in this system and Phineas saw it and he was so offended and God would have struck them all dead instantly Phineas ran and grabbed a javelin which is a spear and it's a, a slender spear it's almost like the ones they use at the Olympic Games just a thin long spear they're designed for throwing distances not for internal warfare and uh, he ran them both through with it killed both of them and that ended what would have been the uniting of the priesthood of God and the priesthood of the Moabs whatever their priest system ran through I didn't bother investigating it because it, they, they all sort of go down a similar path and God said this guy has saved you guys from a terrible fate and he said because this guy respected the priesthood so much and because he respected the doctrine and he respected the covenant which I've already made he said I am going to bring a blessing upon these people and the priesthood that's never been seen before and they, that's what these words are it was a step in a spiritual civilization of an eternal priesthood based on peace Jesus Christ he came into that priesthood because it was made possible because this guy walked in the spirit of his time and did a wonderful thing making possible the blessings which would come after so he set an example and brought a spiritual achievement forward which had never been done before in this way the third one I want to cover King David Psalm 51 verse 8 and this is a remarkable promise which was made equally and David he this is quoted again all of these quoted in the New Testament by the way that's why I've used these resources because they're quoted um, King David 51 8 he had been a very stupid person he had committed adultery with Bathsheba as we know Bathsheba was pregnant the husband all he wanted to do was serve David 
He just wanted to sleep at David's door and protect him because he just had this loyalty about him. David was so ashamed and so embarrassed about what this guy wanted to do and he was trying to cover up the pregnancy. He said, go home, go home and enjoy uh, your, your wife. Go home, enjoy your, your home life. Because he figured that if she revealed her pregnancy a little bit further down the track, he would assume that he was the father and that would cover the sin. But it didn't work out that way. So in the end, David had to get his, uh, uh, if you like, powerful and famous warriors. He had to bring them in a conspiracy to see this guy killed. So what did they do? They got him in the middle of the battle and David said, when they get into battle, just quickly retreat and leave him in the middle of all the enemy. Then they'll kill him and my problem will be over. And that's what he thought. And that's exactly what they did. But his problem wasn't over because he realised that the physical problem had ended but the spiritual problem still needed to be attended to. So in the process of trying to get past this horrible mistake, and mistake is, it was willful. It, some people say, well, there's willful sin and there's unwillful sin. Well, the Bible doesn't really talk like that in this particular area, if at all. It does in some parts. Um, my viewpoint, and I'm saying my viewpoint, is that the bulk of all sins are willful because we all know right and wrong. It's... Uh, I don't go down the trail of willful and non-willful sin because um, you can lie to yourself very cleverly and we, we don't want to lie to ourselves. We want the Lord to work with us. So David had got to the point, he knew he'd done wrong and he kept praying to the Lord to be resolved from the blood guiltness of what had happened. And what happened? God responded. This was the prayer which he spake, Psalm 51 verse 8, which again was another milestone in the spiritual civilization which would be inherited into the spiritual lineage of, um, of blessing, which we enjoy equally in the fellowship, as much as we enjoy with uh, what uh, Abraham had achieved. We are also friends of God. We are also, as Phineas, an everlasting priesthood. I'll cover that in a moment. And now we've got this concept of having sins forgiven, which really were unforgivable by that standard which some people take. So verse 58, 51 verse 8, sorry, this is his petition before Nathan the prophet came to him. This has resulted in Nathan coming to him and revealing God's way for David to resolve the issue. He said, Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Very interesting line, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Some people think that the first person filled with the Spirit was John the Baptist. Wrong. David was filled with the Spirit. In fact, there were three separate anointing occasions where the priests or Nathan the prophet laid hands on him and anointed him. One was uh, before he, when he was that little child, when they came to find him. Then there was the, uh, the appointing to his role as king. Then there was the appointing uh, when they opened up the, uh, the temple system. As it was then, was blankets and a natural one, not a building. But on three occasions, the anointing power was given to David. So here is David with the Spirit in him, but no covenant to keep it there. Here is David with the Holy Spirit power in him, but he had no fallback position like you and I enjoy today. So here he is pleading to God, and listen to his prayer. Verse 12, he says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. David's promise to God in prayer, God, I've committed a terrible sin. I know it's wrong. I'm not hiding it from you. I'm confessing it. If you forgive me what I've done wrong, I will use that forgiveness to turn it around into the favour of the nation and the people and I will go to them and I will proclaim 
the forgiveness and mercy of the Lord. And we sing a chorus. We will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. You know the chorus? Yeah, we sing it. This came out of a person, perhaps not realising, although David was one of the great prophets too, by the way, as well as the king, not realising that he was establishing spiritual civilization for those who would follow after. He actually opened the door to forgiveness and mercy from the things which the law could not forgive people. How, how was that possible? If you needed a blood sacrifice to be cleansed, how would it be possible when there was no sacrifice needed? He opened the door. He made it possible. So we see these three men, Abraham, Phineas, and King David, they brought three articles of a successful spiritual civilization where we would be friends of God, we would be priests of God with an eternal peace covenant with God, and we would equally uh, be able to be forgiven of our sins by, in Acts 13, it's called the sure mercies of David. It's confirmed as being added into the covenant, and that's how God did it. Let's go to Luke chapter 7, verse 28. I'd like to make one more statement. I know we know this, but it's good to have them all put together because it sort of logically rolls from one to the other to the other. There's something else about our generation. Not only do we have those three promises granted unto us as covenant rights, but there's just a little bit more. Sometimes we sit here thinking, how important are I in the plan of God? Some people think they're more important than they are. Fortunately, it's not many, and fortunately, it's probably no one in this room. But there are people who feel they're far more important than the Lord, but the problem is really the people who think they're insignificant and their value to God is really minuscule or doesn't exist. I'd like to cover that point because I think it's vital because if we're going to turn failure into comfort, then we have to go down the same pathway that all the others who at their moment of failure or weakness, whether it was their own fault or the fault of others or a genetic problem as was, say, with Abraham, they all address the weaknesses and failures of the flesh, and God responded. Now, I'd like to go to the spiritual failure that we all have, or all can have, and that is we're not good enough. We're not righteous enough. Luke seven twenty eight. he says, For I say unto you, Jesus speaking, among those that are born of women, that's all people are naturally born, there is no greater prophet, keeping in mind that David was a prophet, and many of these other people were prophets. He said, let, let, it's very important we grab this point. There is no greater prophet than John the Baptist. He is the greatest of all prophets. Now, time uh, delineage brings us to a point where he is after all these other people. And Jesus is saying, right up to this point, from Adam and Eve, right up to now, there has been no greater prophet ever on the face of the earth outside of this man, John the, Pro the Baptist. But... I'd like to tell you something else. He that is least in the kingdom of God, meaning those who will be filled with the Spirit, is greater than he. That means of all the Spirit-filled people in the world, the very least of all the Spirit-filled people in God's sight is still greater than John the Baptist ever was, who was greater than every other prophet who's ever lived. So that's Abraham gone, that's Moses gone. And I'm not talking about being disrespectful to them. I'm talking about a lineage of spiritual civilization which God determined, not me. God wrote this through the Spirit. I didn't. I'm just reading out what he said. This is God's sums on who you are and what your value is to the Holy Spirit and what your value is to God. So when we sit back sometimes and think, oh, I'm no good, I can't do this, I don't witness to people well, I can't... You know, some people can pray for hours. I pray for 10 minutes. My head's rolling around. My eyes want to fall out. God's not going down that trail. God's simply stating a fact that as far as he's concerned, you are greater. Every person in this room, every person listening to what I'm saying who's got the Holy Spirit, you spiritually outrank every other person born up until this time. The worst of you, not the best of you, the worst of you. Very powerful promise, isn't it? Extremely powerful. Now, I'm going to make a point. How do we get 
to this point where all of these promises, these failures of others, how do they come and become a comfort to us? Well, we're going to get another point out the way before we can get to that one. Simple analogy. If you want to go parachuting or skydiving, you don't need a parachute unless you want to do it again. Think about that. You don't need a parachute unless you want to do it again. Now, as much as that sounds hard to joke, well, it is a bit funny. It's sort of a bit of a, sorry, John, a bit of an Irish lean in it. But anyway, let's have a look at it another way. Same thought. If you want to live forever or live again, you need a parachute. It's called the Holy Spirit. If you're happy with this lifetime, hey, you jump out the plane, wee, this is fun. You're only ever going to do it once. The board, Lord tells us, we've got this life once. We don't get this life again. If you want to live again, then you need something on your back which is going to slow down your speed so you can survive what's going to come at the end of your time. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to live again. We're now in freefall on the planet. We're all in freefall, everyone, their lifetime from birth to death, it's that freedom, then the end comes. So it's if you want to live again, then I'll get away for you. And these guys who I've just read out today, they have provided a pathway of spiritual civilization where you can be so confident and so comfortable in God's promises that the only weak link is in your heart and mind what you actually do with God's truth. And one of them shouldn't be that I'm not good enough or I've done too many stupid things in my life because that's totally irrelevant to God. God is good with stupid people or foolish people. God is able to recover people from this world because he specializes in it. And the mechanism which we've just gone through with these names highlights it. John 14 verse 26 I need to be a little bit quicker. I'm sort of running out of time, but we will finish on time. John 14, 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, keeping in mind comfort, this is the great comforter God gives us, the comforter which offers friendship, offers the priesthood, offers forgiveness of King David. All these things were people who, as we read right at the start, that we might be able to comfort others with the comfort wherewith we ourselves have been comforted with. Isn't that what David said? Lord, forgive me my sins so I can go out and preach your forgiveness to others and I will be a comforter unto them as you are unto me. I'll paraphrase that, but that's exactly what his prayer was, the comforter, that we can pray, we can offer comfort for one another but perhaps more importantly, we can actually bring comfort to our own heart when perhaps the darkness of difficulty sits upon us because all these things came out of moments of stress or weakness and God was able to deliver them out of every one of them. And that's a promise. God said, I can deliver them out of them all and it hasn't changed. So the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said. How does this happen? Well, we won't turn to it, but Mark 16, Acts 2, when the people saw the Spirit of God being poured out, they said, what must we do? And Peter said, repent, be baptised in water, which is an action of repentance. Four times in the New Testament, it's called the baptism of repentance. It means what it says. Baptism is a symbol of your willingness to repent and do what God says, regardless of what knowledge you have of anything else. That is your willingness to trust God and make a step in his direction. And he said, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you'll speak in tongues. That is what gets us this concept of the parachute so that you can live again. It's not just between now and death. We can live again. We can go through into a better future than the one we have in the present. God made this promise. Then he goes in. Just do a few things. I just read a couple of scriptures out to you. Let's have a look at uh, the friends concept. James 2.23. Just write, read these three reasonably quickly. Summarize. Then we'll move into a time of communion where we can be giving thanks for the offerings that the Lord has prepared for us in this wonderful situation of providing great comfort for us. And the other thing is, 
you and I, as we overcome the doubts of life, as we overcome some of the gender battles and the economic battles and all the other battles going on which are currently in our society, we are actually setting an example and offering comfort for people who have yet to overcome or who are yet to face some of the problems that life's going to bring to them. We are already setting the example like we read out earlier, these men who have set the example before us. Verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Not only was he righteous, and he was called the friend of God. Here it is, recognised in James as being a valid inheritance and promise of God's people because he offered something which would bring comfort to the people. And from the time Abraham did this right down to where we are now, the concept of being a friend of God has been alive and valid. If you're filled with the Spirit, God says you're a friend of God. Sometimes you don't feel very friendly, but it doesn't matter. It's what God says. God says, I'm your friend. And it doesn't matter what you think in your mind about your status or whatever. God says, forget that. I'm your friend. I make the rules and I'm telling you, I am your friend. Don't argue with God because it doesn't alter the truth. You are the friend of God. This is, was inherited for us. This is one of the comforts wherewith we read here. Sometimes we think it just means that, oh, poor old granny, she died and your granny died, so I'll come and pat you on the back and offer you a bit of comfort. Look, consolation is vital and necessary in so many things. But the type of comfort God's talking about is well beyond that type of low-level comfort or short-term emotional conflict. This is a spiritual civilization which works both in the spirit and equally in the flesh. So we all had the benefit of it. The friend of God. In uh, John 15, 15, this is Jesus speaking now. He says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth what his Lord doeth. He knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. This is now Jesus Christ. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Friends. Jesus Christ said, you're my friends. He started this confirmation rolling, which later on was confirmed by James within the spiritual reality of the church and its governance and the way that God saw it. I've got other references here, but I won't read them. Revelation 1. We're running a little bit out of time, but that's cool. Revelation 1, verse 6. This verse here just makes a very simple statement, confirming the promises made equally to Phineas and equally to King David. And he said, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever. Amen. Now the words here are, He has made us, not he will make us. He has made us priests, we have Phineas, the eternal priesthood. We are friends. Not only are we a priest with a covenant of peace, but we are a friend and priest of God. Then we go on and see that we are equally kings with God. And in the Bible concept where these words came from, the king governed the natural life and the priest governed the spiritual life. And between the natural and the spiritual all the needs of the people were met both for this lifetime and the lifetime to come. And that's how it worked. But we've got that now. It's part, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we're straight away priests and kings because we can fulfill both roles. But at the same time, the problem they had in the uh, Old Testament was that the priests used to make mistakes and you'd have a, a dud high priest and the nation would go downhill until a better priest came along. But we now today, because Jesus Christ has now sat on the right hand of God and we've been raised up under his priesthood, which was perhaps the fourth of being the friend, the eternal priesthood, the sure mercies, now we have an eternal and uh, unflappable high priest who can interpret everything. We now have a mediator which is unable to be spoiled or marred by any form of corruption or pollution, interceding on our behalf, as friends of God, as priests of God, as kings of God, fully empowered to go out and do the work of the Lord. Conclusion. 
conclusion for you and I. These people have gone before us. They've done a job. And we know many of them struggle with different things. That, not a problem. We're going to struggle with things. Not a problem. But they introduced civilization procedures at a spiritual level into the lives of people who didn't know quite often these things were possible. You and I go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature or make it known unto this world what God has made available unto them. Does this world know that they can be friends with God? Friends, not just religious attendees, friends. So the people of this world know that they can be kings in God's eyes, not our eyes, in God's eyes. God's the one calling them king, not me. It's not my invention, it's something God said. Do they not know that they can equally have total rulership over the spiritual forces of life in their life and in their family and amongst those who they speak? They represent the highest authority ever in the universe. Friends, priests, kings, when the eternal representative sitting in the middle with us filled with the Holy Spirit, what a wonderful position to be in. What an irrevocable powerhouse that you and I are if we understand that we can turn any failure into great comfort. And it's even more noticeable when the failure we turn into comfort is no longer our own because we've learned to deal with ourselves we're actually in a very happy place of no longer having to deal with our own failings, but we're now dealing with the failings of others. And that's what we do. We call people, we help them in the name of Jesus Christ. There's deeds to be done, there's prayers to be had, people need to be saved. You and I have a job. Amen. Thank you.